Now, for more than 40 years, my guest today, the former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State, Ambassador Herman Cohen, has probed Africa's most intimate secrets as a top diplomat representing America on the continent. During a 38-year career with the U.S. Foreign Service, Ambassador Cohen served in five African countries, establishing relationships with some of Africa's most legendary leaders, the men who, it could be said, defined modern Africa. From Congo's Mobutu to Zimbabwe's Mugabe, Nigeria's Babangida to Libya's Gaddafi, South Africa's Mandela to Kenya's Arab Moy, to mention a few, Ambassador Cohen knew them all one on one. And his book, titled The Mind of the African Strongman, Conversations with Dictators, Statesmen and Father Figures, captures in vivid color the portraits and personalities of Africa's big men. Some of those portraits are clearly unflattering, often a tale of men whose misguided ideologies dragged their nations into crisis. But it also, it's also a story that captures moments of true inspiration. That's just one of the books that Ambassador Cohen has written about Africa. We'll talk about the other one later in the show and with Ambassador Cohen himself in a moment. But first, here he is speaking, uh, speaking at the U.S. Library of Congress about his book, The Mind of the African Strongman. Why did I write this book? Well, one thing, the U.S., being a U.S. diplomat in Africa, gives you a lot of access. The African leaders tend to like to deal with Americans. You know, we had no colonial history, so we didn't have that mark against us. And we had, we had a tendency, even from the early days of independence, to be very enthusiastic about independence. And we, gave, we brought in a lot of technical assistance, a lot of foreign aid and that sort of thing. And we had some presidents like John F. Kennedy, uh, who were very interested in Africa and showed it. So it was very friendly. So we had a lot of access. So because of that, I was able to meet a lot of these first and second generation heads of state. And the reason I wanted to write about them was that they made the basic decisions after independence that really set the pattern of how Africa would react to the rest of the world and how they would engage in economic development. And I think it tells the story right out of their out of their lips if you, if you read the book. And I'm privileged to introduce my guest today, the author and former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Ambassador Herman Cohen, who joins me from Washington. Ambassador, thank you very much indeed for joining us. And congratulations. I mean, prodigious effort on your part there, um, putting up two books. And I understand another on the way, um, we will, of course, talk about those two books uh, that provide unique insight into Africa, um, clearly from your own on-the-ground experience, but also through the lens and filters of the highest levels of American government, which you were a, a part of. But let's talk about the first, um, which I have to say is quite a riveting read, at least the, the bits that I was able to scan through very quickly, The Mind of the African Strongman. Summarize the book for us. Well, I think it, it shows that the Africans have their own culture, which is quite a normal thing, and that they applied that to, uh, to the independence. How should they govern? You know, when they became, F, when they were colonies, they were governed by Europe. But when they became independent, they had to develop their own systems. And was, to a certain extent, it was experimental. At the beginning, uh, the African leaders tried to emulate Western-style democracy, you know, two-party systems, multi-party systems. And after an initial experience, they said, that this doesn't fit in with African culture. You know, African culture, we have one leader normally, and the, the tribal leader, uh, the chief of the tribe. So let's, let's not do a multi-party. Let's have a single-party system. And in most constitutions, after 1965, Africans changed to this country will have a single party, a single ruling party. We will not have a multi-party system. So that was the first major decision they made. Secondly, on the economic side, they said, well, let's talk to our friends in Europe to see, get some advice from them. And of course, who were the friends of the first African leaders? In England, it was the Labour Party, and in France, it was the Socialist Party. 
And at those days, in, between 1960 and 1970, in France and England, private companies were being nationalized. You know, in England, they nationalized the mining industry. In France, they, they nationalized the banks. So these, these uh, leaders in France and England said to the African leaders, do as we do, nationalize everything, make them government owned enterprises, and then you will use these enterprises to have economic development. So the African leaders like Julius Nyeri in, in Tanzania, uh, and Jomo Kenyatta in Kenya, they, they followed the advice. Unfortunately, it did not turn out the way uh, the Western people expected it, because instead of using the, uh, instead of it right. as, as profit making, they, they created lots and lots of jobs and these companies became loss making. Well, I mean, obviously, there, there's, I mean, there, there's a lot that, that went into those books. I mean, I mean that particular book, actually. Um, why did you decide to write it? Uh, because it, it says, as a subtitle, um, Conversations with Dictators, Statesmen, and Father Figures. So, obviously, different encounters with vastly different personalities and, and, and a variety of leadership styles. I, I'm not sure, I, I don't know if you can hear me, uh, Ambassador Cohen, um, but I was wondering why you decided to write the book. Um, and I, I noticed that your, your picture is fading in and out, and I'm now told that it is frozen. But the, the, the point, of course, is that uh, those books, as I said, I, I managed to scan through them very quickly. Um, the, the one on your screen, U.S. Policy Towards Africa, the other one, The Mind of the African Strongman, um, and uh, the absolutely riveting reads. Uh, it's subtitled um, Conversations with Dictators, Statesmen, Father Figures, and I, I think what, what is interesting is, is the, the way that um, Ambassador Cohen related to those uh, people. I mean, as I said, you know, some of them were dictators, others were father figures, um, others were statesmen, and um, that, that relationship had to be forged, and he had to walk a very tight rope in, in the process, because, I mean, the, you don't relate to Muammar Gaddafi, for instance, the same way that you'd relate to Nelson Mandela. I mean, there, there were f few and far between in terms of the way that they actually carried out policy um, and uh, of course we we know the history and what eventually happened with those uh, with uh, people like uh, Mama Gaddafi and uh, and then you had people who straddled the fence as it were people who were neither um, you know ferociously dictatorial or, or who were simply not um, you know, not, not good governors either. I mean, you, you had quite a lot of people in, in countries like that. Um, and obviously, there, there are some of those leaders who are no longer with us. We're just looking at uh, Mama Gaddafi on the screen there. Some of them forced out of power, some gracefully handing over, but, but all in their own sort of style, um, shaping their countries for better or for worse. And, and uh, I was very interested to know how Ambassador Cohen was going to assess the legacy of someone like Muammar Gaddafi in comparison to, say, Nelson Mandela of South Africa. Um, we're also looking at Daniel Arap Moy there, who was a, um, who was a, a um, president of Kenya. Um, that's another one whose legacy is uh, shrouded in, in some ways. Um, if, you ask, if you ask people in his country, I mean, they're, they're likely to say that there's likely to be a mixed reaction, basically, to his time I in office. Um, we've also got Mobutu Sese Seiko, who is, uh, I mean, I suppose <laughs> requires a book on his own. There's Tabo Mbeki, uh, who, who was the man who took over from... Uh, Nelson Mandela, but I'm told that we've got uh, Ambassador Cohen 
back. Uh, Ambassador, apologies, but um, you've got a rather wonky internet, which is what has uh, affected our communications with you. But I'm delighted to know that you're back. And I was asking you before you went on that short break, why did you decide to write the book? Well, uh, since I was fortunate enough to be able to have long conversations with these leaders, mainly when I was Assistant Secretary of State, because I was the leading representative of the United States for Africa, they were willing to talk. And I said that the story of what they told me is really the story of Africa for the first uh, 50 years of independence. And I thought that was the way to demonstrate to my readers, this is Africa. This is the culture of Africa talking when I'm quoting from these leaders. And I think it's a better way of understanding Africa in my view and i think it, i think it is it worked pretty well okay well um we'll talk about all that some more in a moment we've got to take a break but do stay with us uh, we're the ones taking the break not you you're watching the arise interview plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with the author and former u.s assistant secretary of state ambassador herman cohen stay with us Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyegolu. Now, my guest today is the author of two well-respected books about Africa, The Mind of the African Strongman, Conversations with Dictators, Statesmen and Father Figures is one, and U.S. Policy Towards Africa, Eight Decades of Realpolitik is the other. And the author is, of course, the former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Ambassador Herman Cohen. As an ambassador, advisor to U.S. presidents and a 38-year a veteran of the American Foreign Service, Ambassador Cohen has known every first-generation African leader. According to the U.S. Library of Congress, during his tenure as Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs during the first Bush administration and through his role at the National Security Council in the Reagan administration, Ambassador Cohen worked to bring about peaceful transitions of power in South Africa and Namibia. He also helped to end conflict in Angola, Ethiopia and Mozambique. And Ambassador Herman Cohen is still with me from Washington. Thank you very much indeed, Ambassador, for staying with us. And of course, as I mentioned there, you watched the transition from apartheid to democracy in South Africa, uh, but also um, the change in places like Angola, Mozambique, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, what role did you play in those difficult periods for those countries because the, the, because the perception appears to be that the united states and other western countries either supported the wrong people or, or simply stood by whilst the rights of the africans in those countries were trampled upon yes well during the colonial period uh, we, we had some difficulties for example angola and mozambique were ruled by portugal now, we have bases in the Portuguese Azores that are important for NATO. So it was very difficult for us to start to be criti critical of Portugal uh, for their colonial uh, policies in Angola and Mozambique and Guinea-Bissau. Uh, it was very delicate for us. So we were taking students from those countries, uh, teaching, uh, giving them university scholarships. We're doing quiet things to promote democracy. But it was only after the Portuguese had their own revolution in 1975, when the dictator was overthrown and young officers came in, and they immediately gave independence to all of the Portuguese colonies. And this created another problem because th there was no preparation. There was no education and that sort of thing. Mozambique was fine because there was only one opposition African party, Free Limo, and they took power smoothly. But in, in Angola, there were three opposition anti-Portuguese parties. You had the UNITA, you had the FNLA, and you had the MPLA, and they immediately started fighting with each other. So we had to get involved to stop to stop this these internal fights. Ethiopia had a long war of Eritrean independence. The Eritreans were trying to get their independence, and uh, we did not have terribly good relations with the government there. But then the Soviet Union came in, and they made good friends with uh, George H.W. Bush, my president, when I was assistant secretary. 
and they said to Bush, can you help us in e Ethiopia? We're spending a lot of money supporting the regime there, the, the Derg. It's a Marxist regime, and we want to get out of it. We're spending a billion dollars a year. Can you help us? And we, so, so Bush sent me an order saying, try to make peace in Ethiopia. And I went to see uh, Mengistu Haley Mariam, the president, and he agreed to an arbitration process, which I was leading. And that after about a year, that led to peace and independence for Eritrea. And we repeated the same thing in uh, Mozambique and Angola. So thanks a lot to a certain extent to the Soviet Union and their cooperation, we were able to do the mediation necessary to bring about peace in those three countries. And uh, certainly you are remembered in, in those places. I mean, I, I've read uh, accounts of, of the way that you helped to mediate and to influence transitions in those countries. But having done all that, Ambassador Cohen, how do you assess those countries today and how far they've come? Well, I think Angola's done very well. Uh, all of the former opposition forces uh, are fully integrated. All it took time. The UNITA people, uh, who lost the the election that we had had organized for them uh, in 1992, they lost, and they said, sort of like President Trump did in this country, we refuse to accept the results. We think it was fraud. So they went back to war, and it wasn't until 2012 that they finally. Jonas Savimbi, the head of UNITA, was killed in battle, and they finally achieved peace. But since then, Angola and Mozambique have done quite well in transitioning from colonialism to war uh, to a peaceful situation. Unfortunately, the governance has not always been good, as in many African countries, but I think both of them have done very well. The really terrible problem is Ethiopia. They have never known peace. And it's, and it's mainly ethnic problems in, in Ethiopia. The various ethnic groups have a hard time getting used to each other. And I claim that what they need is true system like Nigeria, a true federal system where every state has its own powers and its own budget. And Ethiopia has never achieved that. And because of that, the different uh, ethnic groups are killing each other for power in the central government. And right now it's the Amhara who are trying to establish a hegemony like they had centuries ago. And, and it's not doing well. That's why there's a lot of war going on there now. Well, I have to say that a lot of people who are in Nigeria might question your assessment of Nigeria having true federalism. I mean, that's a rather controversial issue in the country now. But I mean, we, we will come to talk a little bit about Nigeria a bit later on. But let's return to your very interesting book. And uh, anecdotally speaking, Ambassador Cohen, who are the strongmen leaders in Africa that you find were easiest to get along with? Beyond, of course, the fact that, you know, you may have been laughing with them in the presidential parlor upstairs, whilst in the dungeon downstairs, somebody's legs were getting broken. That's right, that's right. Well. Someone like uh, Omar Bongo, for example, in the small country of Gabon, they had lots of oil money and uh, he just spent it uh, very freely. And uh, I think uh, he he was just uh, a family man. I'm going to promote my family. I remember once uh, he invited, usually I saw him in the office with just the two of us. We discussed U.S.-Gabonese relations, what was happening in West and Central Africa and that sort of thing. And he helped us out with a few problems that we had. And uh, uh, so we were, we were quite friendly. So once he said, well, I want to invite you to lunch in my private residence, my family residence. So I was very flattered to hear that. So I went up there. And I saw, what I saw was many babies. <laughs> Apparently, he was a man who liked to father children. And he had many, many, many mistresses. And there they were in, in the private residence. I must have seen about 25 babies. He was quite proud of it. But generally speaking, he was a very good president and he understood his international role and his role domestically and he, he wanted to do infrastructure. 
So I kind of admired him despite his personal his personal issues. That, that's an interesting one there. But uh, we've got about a minute before we have to take another break, um, Ambassador. And still sort of anecdotally, there's a story about you flying around Africa in a C-130 plane. Tell us about that. Uh, well, I, I'm not... Did I write about that? I'm not quite sure I remember that. But I did a, did a lot of flying around. What I used to do is take commercial aircraft to Frankfurt, Germany. And then the U.S. Air Force would give me a, a, an, an airplane like a C-130. And, and I would use that to visit various countries. Because if I'm going to stay in an African country for two or three days, I can't do it with commercial flights. So, that was, uh, so the U U.S. Air Force was very kind to me. Sometimes they even gave me a jet plane uh, to go around. Okay, well, I, I won't trouble you with the memory of that particular C-130 flight. We'll leave that in abeyance, but do stay with us, Ambassador. We want to talk with you some more. You're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with the author and former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Ambassador Herman Cohen. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview, where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anya Golu. Now, my guest today, Ambassador Herman Cohen, is the former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State and author of two much sought after books about Africa, The Mind of the African Strongman, Conversations with Dictators, Statesmen and Father Figures is one and U.S. policy towards Africa, eight decades of realpolitik, is the other. We've talked quite a bit about the first, so let's look at the second. U.S. policy towards Africa is a comprehensive political history of U.S.-Africa relations, a concise work that carefully chronicles American policy on the African continent across successive presidencies, from the administration of Franklin Roosevelt to that of Donald Trump. Drawing on his years of on-the-ground experience, Ambassador Cohen provides a comprehensive survey and interpretation of nearly eight decades of U.S. policy towards Africa, tracing how this policy has evolved across uh, different administrations since 1942, illuminating the debates that have taken place at the highest levels of the U.S. government and showing how American policy towards Africa has been affected over the years by U.S. relations with Europe, the Soviet Union, the Middle East, and most recently, China. Say between 1985 and 1995, most African governments changed their political systems to allow multi-parties, to allow free media. So when I started out in Uganda, I only saw one newspaper, there was only one TV station, by the time I left in my last post in Senegal, there were many TV stations, privately owned, media, privately owned, uh, civil society was flourishing. So things really were, were shaken up and there was a lot of fresh ideas floating around and uh, things, things were moving ahead. Uh, now, U.S. policy at the time started to change also. We were thinking mainly of foreign aid giving aid to the government so they can invest in, in infrastructure or education or health, we started to think, well, maybe, maybe we ought to change as well. And we started to, President uh, George H.W. Bush, he was the first president to say, let's spend money on promoting democracy in Africa. And I was assistant secretary for him. And we started spending money promoting democracy, multi-party systems, teaching parliamentarians how to be independent parliamentarians. And also, George H.W. Bush started to promote private sector investments. This is something we had never done. You know, we said foreign aid will do it. We'll give money to the governments and let them spend on, uh, on development. But we reached the conclusion that if people are not investing to start businesses, start production facilities, then they're really not going to move ahead. So we started promoting that. And the way we did it was to say, you need the environment so that your own people will invest money. 
And that's uh, Ambassador Herman Cohen uh, talking to people at the U.S. Library of Congress there and uh, summarizing his book, uh, U.S. Policy Towards Africa, Eight Decades of Realpolitik. And uh, the former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State, Ambassador Herman Cohen, is still with me from Washington. Thank you for staying with us. And uh, we heard you touching briefly on the... Um, general thrust of U.S. policy towards Africa over a period of time, um, a, a longer period, of course, uh, captured in, in your book, um, Realpolitik, U.S. Policy Towards Africa. Um, clearly uh, an important reference book there. Just summarize its contents for us. Well, uh, I wanted to show uh what the U.S. was thinking about an African to do. And there was a major debate in 1957 when the president was Dwight Eisenhower. We were in the middle of the Cold War. So the argument was, should we ask Africans to support us in the Cold War or shouldn't we? And there was a strong debate. And those who said, the Cold War is the most important thing. So we should say to the Africans, you're with us or you're against us. If you support us in the Cold War, will give you all sorts of good things. If you don't, well, forget about it. But Richard Nixon, who was the vice president at the time, he said, forget about that, the Cold War. The Africans are just becoming independent. They don't want to join any bloc. They want to be neutral. So let us, let them be neutral. And President Eisenhower said, yes, let them be neutral in the Cold War. Our emphasis should be on economic development. And he even used the term we must win their hearts and minds. This was an American general talking like that. And that sets the stage for our policy throughout the, these days, uh, 50 years or 80 years of supporting economic development and later including support for de the development of democratic systems. Uh, Ambassador Cohen, that U.S. policy towards Africa, as you said, evolving over nearly sort of eight decades, um, what's been the trajectory of that evolution? Has it been a steady improvement, progression, or, or a sort of back and forth, bearing in mind the likes of Donald Trump? Well, yes, it's been, uh, it, it hasn't changed that much uh, throughout U.S. administrations, Democrat and Republican. They all adhere to, this, to the same policy. Economic development is what Africa needs, and democracy will be good for economic development. Therefore, let us, let us promote both. And I'm not going to criticize Trump on this. I'm, I'm very anti-Trump myself, I will admit it. But I'm not going to criticize Trump because, first of all, he didn't change anything. You know, the first thing he did when he took power was anything that Obama did, I'm going to change it. I'm going to get rid of it. But he didn't do that in Africa. He accepted the African Growth and Opportunity Act, which was done by President Clinton. He, he accepted the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which was done by George W. Bush. He accepted PEPFAR, you know, the, the medicine against HIV AIDS, which was done by George W. Bush. Uh, and he accepted uh, Obama's Power Africa promotion of more pr more electric power, which a which Africa badly needs, and he accepted a feed the future, which is promote better, more productive agriculture. So Trump did not change any of those things. And in addition, he added one thing: he added promotion of American investments in Africa. It's, it was called, I think it was called Popular Africa, and that still exists. So I, I was not a fan of Trump for many reasons, but for Africa policy, I thought he, I thought he did very well. And uh, Ambassador Cohen, you, you mentioned uh, electricity there, power, and, and of course um, that's an essential part of the real economy. We all know that what powers the real economy is electricity. You currently represent the biggest uh, American British power generation company in Africa called Contour Global Power. Tell us about what it is doing in Africa and where. Well, Contour Global believes that the best way to expand the power is to have private sector investments. So their policy is we will finance the power station 
and then we will get in, earn our money back and make profits by selling the power. So one of the power projects that I'm so proud of is in Lome, Togo. They built the power plant and are now selling power to the utility of Togo as well as to Benin. And they're collecting money uh, regularly and the government and the utility pays regularly because the people are paying for the power when they consume it in their homes. So I personally believe, and Contour is right, that this is the future of power. And then there, even, there are three power stations that Contour Global has done in Nigeria, two in Lagos State and one in Benin, in, uh, in Benin City, I believe. And then the, most recently one in Senegal. And there's one in Rwanda, which is really fascinating. There's methane gas seeping up from the bottom of Lake Kivu. And Contra Global has managed to collect that gas and turn it into power, which is feeding Rwanda right now. So they have five power stations, private power stations in Africa, and they're looking for more opportunities. Well, thanks for that uh, summary. Let's return to your book um, about U.S. policy towards Africa. W would you say that mistakes were made with U.S. policy towards Africa that might have cost the African continent dearly? Well, uh, yes, I think we could have uh, we could have moved more quickly on the apartheid issue. I think uh, because uh, at the time of the Cold War, uh, the Cold War seeped into our policy towards South Africa, and because the white minority government there was very anti-communist, uh, we were very slow in beginning to work against uh, apartheid. But Henry Kissinger was very smart. He saw a growing sentiment in the U.S. against apartheid. This was not just the black community. It was white people all over the U.S. were beginning to say, we got to help get rid of apartheid. Sunday sermons in churches all over the U.S. So Kissinger said, let's start out with the white man Rhodesia. Let's show what can happen. So they persuaded the head of Rhodesia, Ian Smith, to go to, to the British and negotiate an end of white minority rule in Rhodesia. And in 1980, that took place. And it showed that it worked out pretty well. The white people weren't being killed or anything like that. They had a smooth... So that gave the idea to South African whites. Well, maybe we can do the same thing and maintain our good economy. And F.W. de Klerk took the lead as a younger white leader, and he brought about the transition to the end of apartheid. I, I would say we played a role, but I think we waited too long. We could have done it maybe 10, 15 years earlier. Well, I, I think a lot of people would agree with that analysis. And um, there are people who think that because of the absence of a direct history with Africa, colonial and otherwise, the U.S. never really understood the continent. Where do you stand on that? Well, uh, I would agree that uh, it took us a while to, to get to know Africa. Uh, we d Americans decided not to colonize Africa. We had the means, we had the Navy, we had everything possible. But in, uh, in 1807, Thomas Jefferson arranged the Louisiana Purchase, this vast area of land west uh, of, uh, of the 13 original states, Louisiana. So people said, should we go to Africa and have colonies, or should we go to the western part of the United States? And of course, it was much easier to colonize the western part of the United States. And the missionaries who went to Africa early on, the, the Protestant missionaries, they sent back terrible <laughs> reports of malaria and that sort of thing. And they said, please don't come here. Don't come here. It's a place to get sick. And so therefore, we never colonized Africa. And it took us a while before we, we, we learned uh, about African culture and that sort of thing uh, through, our, through the British and the French. Uh, uh, Ambassador, we've got about a minute before we have to take our final break. Um, where do you think the U.S. stood on colonialism? Did it support the end of colonialism in Africa, or did it sort of straddle the fence on that one? We supported the end of colonialism very early. At the end of the First World War, our president was Woodrow Wilson, 
and he went to the Versailles Peace Conference with a document called 14 Points. And one of the points was, we must work to end colonialism all over the world. And there was an, a Republican, he was Democrat, his Republican counterpart, John Foster Dulles said, white people should not rule over people of color. And so this was the beginning of our anti-colonial. Uh, now, the, the Europeans rejected that right away. All they wanted was reparations from Germany. That's all they cared about. So they didn't move. But there was somebody in Wilson's delegation who understood. It was Franklin Roosevelt. So when he became president, he started the movement against colonialism. And after the end of the Second World War, we didn't stop bothering the French and the British. And colonialism, and colonialism. They were angry at us. They wanted colonialism to pay for their rep for the reconstruction after World War Two. Okay. So, yeah, so it was a hard slog, but the U.S. was in the forefront. Right. Okay. We must take a break, but we'll come straight back. You're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with the author and former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Ambassador Herman Cohen. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anier Gould. Now, our focus today is on two books that capture the spirit and essence of Africa, both books written by the former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Ambassador Herman Cohen. The first book is called The Mind of an African Strongman, Conversations with Dictators, Statesmen and Father Figures, and it's written with wit, vivid color, and a sharp analytical eye. And the second is titled U.S policy towards Africa, eight decades of realpolitik, and it chronicles evolving U.S. policy towards the continent from 1942 through to the Trump administration. Both books authored by the former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Herman Cohen, who also served as an American ambassador in both Africa and Europe and as a presidential advisor at the White House. And uh, Ambassador Herman Cohen is still with me from Washington. Uh, thank you very much indeed for staying with us. Um, looking at those books, particularly the first one that talked about um, dictators, statesmen, and father figures, there were leaders that straddled the fence in Africa, weren't there, between good and bad. They, they were not so bad and uh, not so good. Who would you place in that category? Well, uh not, not so bad, I think, was Robert Mugabe. You know, he was known as, he was a very authoritarian leader and he didn't, he didn't like opposition, but I think he was basically a democratic at heart. I, you know, he was a good friend in the non-aligned movement of Saddam Hussein uh, of Iraq, uh, who was really, an, a really an evil person. So when Saddam Hussein uh, invaded Kuwait, uh, President Bush said, um, wrote, uh, Mugabe and Zimbabwe are on the Security Council, and we want to get a resolution authorizing us to use force to get Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. So, so go see Mugabe. I said, oh my God, you're sending me to see Hussein's best friend, uh, Robert Mugabe. I, I'm, I'm really worried about that. So I, I, I went to uh, Harare uh, to see Mugabe, and I explained what was going on, and I, was, I thought he was going to say, get out of my office. Uh, you know, Saddam Hussein is my best friend, he, and he thought about it for a while, and he says, you know, I don't like it when strong powers invade weak powers. So I am going to support you on this resolution against Saddam Hussein. I almost fainted when I saw that. So that's why I say Mugabe was sometimes not so good, but very often he was very good. And uh, there, were, there were several African leaders like him. I mean, one leader that you also mention in your book, uh, Ambassador Cohen, is Nigeria's military president, Ibrahim Babangida. What was your relation, relationship with him like, and what's your assessment of his time in office? Well, I, I thought he was, he was trying to do to very, very well. I remember he asked me to come after President Reagan bombed Libya uh, because of 
of an incident that happened in Germany where there was Libyan terrorism against the Americans, Bob and Gita asked me to come and show him the pictures of the bombing. Uh, and I brought the aerial photos and I, I, he, he received me in Lagos and he was thrilled to be able to see it. And from that point on, we, we became friendly. And uh, he, he told me that he really wanted to establish democracy. Uh, he wanted to get out of the business of military rule. And he, so he, it led to that famous election uh, which uh, went off very well, and then he canceled the election. And I never quite got an explanation from him about them. I, I visited him after he was no longer president. I visited him in his home, and I never got an explanation of that uh, to this very day. Well, uh, there's a question mark over that. I mean, a, a lot of um, people are still wondering why that election, which is considered to be the freest and fairest in Nigeria's history, was annulled. But of course, uh, Nigeria today, Ambassador, under the leadership of President Buhari, um, what do you make of his time in office uh, from the point of view of the U.S. and its policy towards Nigeria? I think uh, we've had very good relations with Nigeria. You know, we we have the same objective of promoting private industry. Uh, U.S. Uh, oil companies in Nigeria have been very well treated. Uh, other investors in Nigeria have been very well treated. We think it's a very safe place to invest. In fact, when people ask me if you advise Americans where to invest in the United States, I always say, look at Nigeria. It's a very friendly place for the private sector. And it, it is a country where, unlike most African countries where Africans don't invest in their own countries, Nigeria has, has Nigerian investors. Look at Dangote. Uh, you don't see people like Dangote all over the rest of Africa. So I have a very favorable view. Of course, you have the problem of, uh, of corruption, which most countries have. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a bit too severe in Nigeria. That's a problem for the Nigerian people. But I, but I have very good, good feelings toward my Buhari, I think, disappointed because he came in on an anti-corruption platform mainly. And I don't have the impression that he really solved, the, solved that issue. And of course, um, Ambassador Cohen, having to deal, I mean, you've just mentioned a range of leaders. Uh, we've talked about people like Mandela. You've talked about you know, um, Robert Mugabe, you've talked about Babangida, Buhari, and so on. Um, having to deal with these different leaders would have tested your diplomatic skills. I mean, you would have had to be flexible, creative, empathetic, but also tough if that was required. How did you manage all that? Well, it, it took many years of training, many years of experience in dealing with heads of state. I found that two things uh, worked well for me. One was have a good sense of humor, you know, try to inject humor, and also ask a lot of questions. I found that African head of state were flattered when I asked them about what do you do for, uh, for economic issues? What do you do for agriculture? Is there any way we can help you in, uh, in police reform and that sort of thing? They were flattered that I was asking their opinions instead of telling them, oh, this is what you should do and that sort of thing. And, I, I found that that worked very well, especially, I think I spent most of my career asking questions and, and, and getting the answer helped us formulate policy. And I remember when Mandela was allowed to get out of prison, they put him in a villa and he walked on the streets and nobody knew who he was <laughs> because nobody had seen him, you see, but he was a, he was a fabulous person. I mean, uh, I know that some of those uh, leaders that you, you, you mentioned in your book, uh, some of them have passed on. Um, but for those who are still around, or at least who were around when the book came out, I wonder if some of those leaders you mentioned in that book have had the chance to read it and perhaps react to it. Uh, yes, I think Gaddafi uh, reacted. Gaddafi <laughs> reacted. He... Uh, he argued with some of my conclusions. He, th he thought he was a, uh, a, a president who unified the people. And I, I said that he wasn't. He was sort of, uh, he didn't really have a government. He was a one man, he was a one man show. He disputed that, uh, but in a, in a very friendly way. 
uh, and uh, he, once he said to me, I, I want to tell you something you love, he says, I mean, you know, before he came to power, there were a lot of Italian Jewish people living there. It was an Italian colony. And the previous ruler, the King Idris, he expelled all the Jews when, Palace, when Israel was created. So Gaddafi came in later and he said to me, you know, Mr. Ambassador, I'm going to invite the Jews to come back and I'm going to give them all their property. I said, well, congratulations. Uh, I think that's a good idea. And later I came back to lecture uh, and I, at a university there and I said, well, did the Jews come back? And they said, yeah, he all came, they all came back, but then they left again. They sold their property, took their money and left again. <laughs> so some of his schemes never did not work out. But he was, he was not all bad, but he, he was a total, total egomaniac. He thought he, he was the smartest guy in the world and knew everything. That's why he supported revolutionaries in the Philippines, in Northern Ireland, and various other places. <clears throat> well, I have to say, uh, Ambassador Cohen, it's been an absolute delight talking with you today and sharing your experiences on the African continent and getting into those two books that you have written about Africa. Thank you very much indeed. That's it for this edition of the Arise interview. Join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja and Washington. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.